Hi, and welcome back to Glassboxed, writing automated cucumber tests. Uh, this is the second video in my automated cucumber scripts titled writing a basic cucumber script and today we are going to continue where we left off from the first video and actually write a basic script uh, with step definitions so that our feature file will pass when we run it so for those who haven't watched uh, my first video please do so before watching this as it explains a lot of fundamental concepts on building the framework so today we will look at understanding a little bit more about the runner class, uh, understanding a little bit more about the feature class, uh, actually writing a step definition to go with our feature, um, and then running it and seeing what happens. Uh, so let's begin. So the first thing we're going to do is just talk a little bit more about the runner class uh, and explain in a little bit more detail. Uh, right. So. Again, as explained in the previous video, but I'll go over it really quickly. What we did is we created a cucumber package, and in our cucumber package, uh, we put a cucumber runner class. We then created a, a, a features package and put that inside the cucumber package, and then put our features uh, in our features package. Uh, that probably sounds a little bit confusing, uh, but I'm assuming that if you just take a look at this hierarchy, it should be very self explanatory. So, in a little bit more detail, what is the job of the runner class? What does it actually do? So, what it actually does is, when we run a feature file, what happens is, the feature effectively uh, is looking for a runner class. It's looking for a class to help it to find step definitions somewhere else, uh, somewhere uh, within the project, somewhere that uh, is defined by the runner class. So in our runner class, what we do is we first just say whenever we run this class, we run it as part of a cucumber class. So what that means is anything that's in the cucumber class, so anything that's governed, uh, any rules uh, that cucumber needs uh, when it runs, is all I in a sense inherited as part of this class. Um, don't mistake inheritance uh, for the run with. Uh, they are two different things entirely. They're not the same, uh, but they say similar concepts if you like. Uh, then what we do is we uh, add some options which the cucumber class has so when I say run cucumber class it's almost a really abstract or maybe even a cheeky way of saying because we're running this cucumber runner class uh, with the cucumber class uh, almost inexplicitly we are able to uh, use options and pass in the options to the class when it runs so in this instance we have two different options uh, in essence we don't actually need this option in order to run our framework I just left it in there for the sake of uh, just kind of getting the ball rolling with reporters um, probably going forward I'll probably do a much more detailed video on reports and actually show you uh, the various kind of reports you can generate sometimes reports are actually incredibly important because uh, let's just say you're, you're writing this just for purely personal purposes report might not be very important but if you're say working on a client's base and they're interested in reports and let's just say the reports have to be in a certain format or have to abide by certain rules you can somewhat have a little bit of power over that here so in this instance we're always saying is uh, when we run our features just produce a JSON but I can very well just say something like um, run HTML instead uh, there are various options uh, there are other report uh, structures as well again uh, we'll go into that uh, in a future video the next uh, is addressing the very first point we talked about when we run a feature uh, file which is when we run a feature file where are all our features and and that's what's defined here so this is just kind of governing um, the location of our features we can do a lot more in our cucumber class uh, for example we can adding things like tags which uh, can effectively turn a cucumber uh, runner class almost into a cucumber suit uh, again that will require a little more, more explanation and I think the focus of the moment should purely be at just trying to get everything working uh, to a level where we are happy that everything is working 
So the Cucumber class actually has a lot of other features that I haven't talked about uh, purely because uh, the focus of this video at the moment is just trying to get everything glued together properly. Uh, and that's pretty much it really for the Cucumber class. It's not uh, too uh, complex or difficult to understand. You just need to grasp uh, the idea that um, w when I run a feature uh, file uh, this class also runs and this class effectively uh, has these options which helps us uh, to run our feature file. Now let's talk about the feature file. So in our last video I talked about the, uh, the kind of construct of a feature file and the construct is that it has a feature although this is optional you don't have to have it uh, but it is most certainly one of the top advice I would give is that have a feature uh, have a line that just says the feature and the uh, the high level description of your feature in that class purely because uh, let's just say our feature file had multiple scenarios and scenarios can get very detailed uh, using various things such as data tables and, and parameters it can get very confusing uh, to someone who's trying to figure out the type of tests in this feature file if something like the feature uh, was missing so by having a feature uh, and then a description, it almost highlights the purpose of that feature file and almost uh, identifies the type of tests in that feature file. So if you are going to take one thing away from this video other than building this framework is that make sure that you have a feature uh, keyword with a line. It, it doesn't run, it, it's almost treated as a comment when you run your feature file, it doesn't affect your test at all. But from a high level perspective in terms of understanding what your feature file is this is equally important as writing a scenario i would say so the second is scenario uh, right so an easy way to explain it is if i were to compare to the compare this to say something like junit so in our junit when, when we write a junit test we have um uh so when we write a junit test we usually have something similar to this where we say test then we say public uh, or the, the actual test method uh, it's something, something like this and then we have uh, the contents ooh, of our test here uh, followed by assertion and and and, uh, and so on so if we compare this, the construct of a test method uh, for a JUnit or various other uh, other testing frameworks and we compared uh, the Cucumber scenario, what it is is when we say scenario, we're effectively annotating any steps after the scenario as if it was a test. So when we say scenario, we're almost it's almost identically saying this is a test uh, identified in a feature file. When we then say steps, so let's just say at this moment we're saying given uh, something, uh, when something, and then then uh, something. It's almost like saying these are the steps to the code that happened inside a JUnit test. Now a little bit more about uh, these given whens and thens. So givens traditionally, uh, well actually before I talk about that, I did mention this in my previous video. Uh, this given when and then keywords are completely irrelevant to the actual code that is written inside uh, the method that the step relates to. So let me just get rid of that just to kind of stop any confusion. So as I said the given uh, keyword doesn't make any difference at all to how the code inside this mapped step definition would work at all. Uh, it's important you kind of know that because this given when then is only there for readability purposes. It's just to make your life easier and this is why. The purpose of a given uh, step is usually to set the the scope of a t test, it's set the presence of a test. So let's just say we were trying to um, uh, open up a web browser, go to a website, so let's just say go to um, uh, my zoo website. So if I just really quickly uh, go to it uh, so here for example so this is a, a web page that's effectively um, navigated to the my, to my zoo website and then there's various other links and so on the purpose of the given step is just to effectively just set up your test it's usually not really used to do any 
kind of logical checks or any logical actions such as clicking on something or or or, or, or um, checking that something exists somewhere nothing the given is only the the presence uh, it's the setup it's the introduction to the test if you like the when step of a scenario or the function of this when is to actually do something is to perform an action so let's just say in this case our given was go to zoo website uh, the when could have been something like uh, click on adoption for instance the when action doesn't necessarily have to be a single action it could be multiple actions uh, so let's just say it could be something like uh, given I go to web, uh, the zoo site uh, when I click on adoption you can have more steps if you want you can then have further more when steps if you like saying something along the lines of uh, when I click on adoption uh, when I click on check uh, so, so check and so on and the then part of the scenario, the purpose of then part is to effectively perform the check of the test. So in this instance, we could say something like check that uh, sorry animal not available message was displayed. So if I were to rewrite it, something along the lines of given I uh, navigated to the zoo website, set effectively setting up our test well, when. I click on the adoption link so we click on the adoption link and we can use another construct called the end keyword it's exactly like the given when uh, steps so it says like and I uh, click on uh, the check button then I check to see that no animals are available. So in my previous video I actually was really naive with the way I wrote my steps uh, but now if you look at these steps a little bit more they actually make a lot more sense given I am somewhere in other words to set up when I click on something and click on something else so these two steps are setting up the actions uh, or the conclusion to the step and then the then is what actually checks uh, to make sure that everything was uh, checked and if there are any assertions you would expect it to be in the then so really quickly uh, taking a step back let me just quickly discuss what and is um, and doesn't really play any logical role in the sense of a given when then traditionally people have the steps given when and then in that order uh, and usually can be put almost anywhere. So I can say and there, um, I can have an and there if I like, uh, I can have two there if I like. It's, it's, it's almost building up on the previous step, uh, on the previous step if it's a when or a then. So in this case, when I do this and I do this and I do this, then I check for something and I check for something. So that's the kind of construct we take. Right. So, and that's kind of my more detailed perspective on what a feature file is and the purposes and the given uh, sorry and the uh, description of these keywords so now let's run this perfect so now effectively what we're being told is that these steps are missing in that they have been identified in a feature file and Eclipse knows that these steps exist in a feature file but Eclipse is also saying it was unable to find these steps so now we're actually going to do the magic what we're going to do is implement these steps uh, and this is how we do it usually people would just write uh, say steps here and then they'd instantly go and uh, copy those steps into a step definition file what I tend to do is I tend to be a little bit more clever about it I, I just literally run my test and then any steps which aren't found are given here and they're usually in the format as well uh, they're in the format about 80% of the time the 20% of the time is where you need to do a little bit of rejigging so what we're going to do is we're just going to copy all of these steps so notice for the given steps it knows it's a given for the when and same for the then again it knows so it kind of does a little bit of handling for us so what we're going to do is we're just going to copy these so we've got them uh, in our computer memory and now what we're going to do is we're going to create a new step definitions class in the features package so right click new class 
and give it a name. So I usually give it uh, the name of step definitions. Uh, for the purposes of this framework anyway, uh, if we were to build, uh, let's just say, a larger framework, I would surely give this uh, class a much more meaningful name. And the reason why you would give it meaningful names is because uh, you would want certain steps to belong in certain classes. Uh, but for the purpose of this video, let's just keep it a little bit simple and let's just say that all the steps exist in only one class. So let's finish this. Perfect. Now all you do is you paste in the steps. Now you'll get errors uh, naturally. What you need to do is uh, import in all the libraries using the shortcut which I use is uh, Control shift o And now what will happen is when you run it will find all the features uh, but it will throw an exception it will throw a pending exception which basically means that uh, the step was found but the step hasn't been implemented it's something that um, Qcombe automatically gives us so let's just see what happens when you actually run it without implementing anything ourselves so we run the step and it's basically said uh, I tried to run this particular step and I got an exception and it didn't even bother running the other steps because there's no point because this happens in order from top to bottom there's no point in running the other steps if the first one fails and that's another key thing to understand about feature files whenever we run a scenario so let's in this instance we only have the one scenario so let's just say we had something like this we have three scenarios just assume they're different for the moment I know they're not but let's just assume they are what would happen is let's just say in this scenario the first step fails this fails it won't I run the other steps because there's no point uh, if if a part of a test fails there's no point it won't run anything else because it makes no logical sense to run everything else then let's just say this was a completely different test and this ran and all the steps ran fine then that's fine this would do this entire scenario would count as a scenario that passed this scenario would count as a scenario that failed now let's say we were running this one and it ran the first one without any problems and the second without any problems and it ran the last step and it failed this scenario would also be counted as a scenario that failed so it's important to understand that when one step fails every step in that given scenario fails uh, but to be more blunt about it if a step fails in a scenario the remaining steps don't even run uh, so I hope you kind of I hope I've made that crystal clear alright back to our step definition so what happened? So we got uh, an exception saying pending exception because we haven't implemented anything. Uh, so that's actually a step in the right direction in that at least now our feature file is able to pick up the steps that we defined. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm just going to get rid of all this. But before I write any code, I'm going to explain what these steps actually mean. So what happens? So let me just quickly save this. Right. So what happens? You get rid of that so when we run our feature file and it goes to this line here effectively it's basically saying okay I need to go and find the code that's implemented for this given step if it has been implemented so it goes to the runner class runner class says everything is in here go look in there and it looks in there and it eventually ends up in this step definitions class and what it then does is it first looks for this keyword in the form of an annotation and then it tries to map the string for that step in the form of a parameter passed to that annotation. So if we now look at the step definition, this is exactly what's happening here. So this given is translated into an annotation. And then this string is translated into effectively uh, part of a regex pattern which is then passed into the given. So here we're saying given I navigated to this uh, to the zoo website that is directly mapped to this and this is how the mapping is done so this given when then and uh, the and uh, keywords are mapped to annotations in our Java class and the rest of the step is almost passed as a string to the annotation and when it finds an, a matching annotation and a matching string it runs the method that the annotation is marked for. So in this case what happens is when we run this method or, or rather uh, when we try to run this step it tries to find a matching uh, annotation when it finds the matching annotation it runs the method that the annotation is matched uh, to. 
So that's the first thing, uh, and that's almost how the uh, the relationship between a defined step in a scenario and the defined step definition in a class is. Now, one thing I did was I directly copied uh, these steps from the error that was generated before this class existed. Uh, one of the things it does is it um, creates this uh, long name. Now, there's absolutely nothing stopping you from changing it. You can make it whatever you want. Usually, what Cucumber does is it tries to be a little bit clever and it tries to name the method uh, identical to the step uh, uh, excluding the annotation. So if you like, you can keep it as is. It's completely up to you. Now naturally, if you uh, follow um, kind of Java's uh, rules, or rather OOP rules on naming things in a certain convention, then obviously this won't, this isn't probably very sensible. So what I do is I just kind of change it. So I, uh, in fact, I don't even do that. I, I usually rename it to what I think is more sensible. So in this case, I will just call it something like um, uh, should navigate to zoo. So here we're saying I click on adoption of it. So I just say something like uh, should click on adoption. And here I'm effectively going to end up doing an assertion of some uh, means or another to check that animals are available. So I'm just going to say um, uh, check uh, animal string visible and that's it so now what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm just gonna uh, print out some statements just to prove that uh, uh, not necessarily to prove in this video but just to prove the concept that uh, the right steps are talking to the right methods so in this case I'm just say um, uh, executed the navigate to zoo method In here, I'm going to say uh, executed the click on adoption link method, and finally, I'm going to say uh, checked that the no uh, animals string uh, was visible or not. Right. So now let's go back and now let's run and see what happens. And there you go. So what so what happened? So first of all, if we just take a look at the uh, the summary of our test and the summary is usually at the very bottom. It says there was one scenario in total and one scenario in total passed and there were three steps and of the three steps three pass so this is effectively saying there was a hundred percent pass rate for this particular run if we now have a look at uh, the first few lines of code what actually happened so what happened was we printed out the statement executed the navigate to zoo method uh, followed by the click to your adoption link and finally followed by the check no animal string was visible or not so that means our steps now certainly pick up the methods. So our steps are now definitely picking up our methods. If we take a little bit more look, we can now see that there's actually more information about the actual feature we run. It's printed out the feature, followed by uh, the description that we gave it. It's printed out the scenario and the steps in order. And it's printed out exactly where those steps were found, in what class, what the name of the methods were. This is why I changed it because it just makes almost more uh, well. It's it's easier on the eyes to actually read uh, as opposed to if it had been I underscore navigated underscore to underscore there and so on so on so on. So what have we learned? Well, in this video, uh, first of all, this video wasn't as. Uh, technically heavy as the first one uh, but comparison I think we've learned a lot more from this than from the first uh, but anyway from this video we learned a little bit well a lot more about the purpose of the runner class uh, well I hope you have uh, we've definitely learned 
a lot more about the feature file, the kind of rules that are governed, um, what this means to who. Uh, and we learned how to actually write step definitions and how to map a step uh, definition to a step in a feature file. Uh, we also picked up uh, well, what I like to say is, uh, is some, some good advice on how to uh, generate these methods for us uh, without us having to kind of do it ourselves. Uh, naturally, if you are uh, if you think it a bit hardcore, then yeah, go for it. Uh, I I usually write my own steps, uh, but you know, once you've kind of written uh, a scenario with with about 20, 30, 40 odd steps, it can become a little bit tricky to try and kind of negotiate between uh, the number of steps you've written and the number of step definitions you've written. It's just easier just to run everything once and just uh, copy paste. Uh, be well, one of my policies is if it's not broke, why fix it, right? So if if Eclipse is willing to help us do something a lot more easily, then yeah, use it to your advantage. Go ahead and do it that way. Uh, and finally, we uh, we just uh, proved just by printing out the statements that uh, our feature steps are certainly talking to our step definitions. And the last thing I'd like to say is, we've written all our step definitions in this one step definition class. If we were to write, let's just say, many more feature files, so let's just say we had about 20 different feature files. So, in fact, let's do it. Let's just let me. I'll just create a, a duplicate feature file. Right. And I go in there. And let's just say we had. Uh, let's let's change these uh, for a bit. So I navigate to the zoo website. So this time, instead of clicking on the adoption link, I'm just going to click on the about link. And then I won't do a check. I just want to keep this a bit simple. And I run this. What do you think is going to happen if I run this now? Uh, well, obviously, I, I don't know what your answers would be. But this is what would happen. When it tries to run this step, it'll be fine because this step exists in the step definition already. However, this step doesn't. Uh, this is a brand new step. This is different to uh, the adoption step. So let's run this and let's see what happens. There you go. So from top to bottom, we said executed the navigate to zoo method, uh, but however, uh, the scenario in its kind of entirety was undefined, and it is. It's undefined. Uh, the full scenario is not fully defined, so it ended up with an undefined. And it knew there were two steps in total, and one passed, i.e., the first step, and the second step didn't because it was undefined. And the reason it's undefined is yes, you've guessed it. The step doesn't exist in the step definitions. So should we now just quickly copy this? put it in here and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm just going to print out a, uh, a system out really quickly and uh, let's just say um, executed the click to about link method uh, should click on about. Now if you run it Oh, there were errors somewhere. Hold on. Where are the errors? Ah, of course. See, now it was fine. Uh, it uh, printed out both strips. Yeah. The reason why I've done this, I wasn't going to actually do this. This wasn't part of my video. Uh, I thought it's probably best if I did it. The reason I did this is because I wanted to show we have two different step definitions. And both step definitions share some steps. And both, uh, sorry, we have two feature files, and both feature files share some steps, uh, but they also have different steps. So what happens is all our feature files share the same step definition class. And so if we just had all our steps in here, whenever we run a feature, they will all get called from here. Some would say, hold on, this is actually quite bad. Uh, because you end up with various steps in one class is also it's, it becomes difficult to maintain uh, no it doesn't and this is why if I copy this step definition uh, call it 2 uh, we shouldn't name classes with numbers definitely number name classes with numbers uh, but this is just to make things a little bit quicker I suppose on my end and I go in there and what I'm going to do is from this one I'm going to get rid of this given step and I'm going to get rid of this last when and from this one 
I'm going to get rid of the two in the middle. So we now have two step definition clauses. Uh, this has some steps which are in some feature files and this has some in some. So in another way to think of it is uh, both feature files are using both step definitions. So now let's run and see what happens. It was fine. And the reason it was fine is this. Whenever a step, uh, whenever a feature file runs, it looks for that given step uh, in any given step definition class. In other words, if that step, uh, the definition for it has been implemented anywhere, go and get it and run it. And that's pretty much what happened here. The reason why you might want to run multiple different step definitions. So this is going back to the very first point when I said, let's just make a step definition class for the purpose of this to keep it simple. The reason why you would have multiple step definition classes is because you might actually have, you might have, I don't know, uh, you might have a step definition of classes that only has givens and nothing else. So the purpose of that step definition class might only be to help set up tests and nothing else. Uh, why might you do that? Because then you can use various things like, um, let's just say, I don't know, the inheritance. So you can say something like inherit, um, I don't know, uh, uh, common given uh, something. Uh, why? Because you might have, let's just say, like a like a, a base class which has various methods uh, which are only or which should only be available to given methods. For example, if you're writing some kind of web driver framework, you might want to be able to say navigate to certain websites, navigate to certain pages, uh, populate certain things as part of a test, and you might write all of that somewhere else. Another way to think of it is, you might actually have some logic classes which are separated from your step classes because you don't want to you don't want to end up with something like this do you, you don't want to have something like public void uh, do magic method which does some kind of logic and then you have various other methods which do various other things and then you, these methods are used uh, in, in your in your steps you don't kind of want them in the same place because it clutters up your step definitions right but if you were to move them in your inheritance uh, then this makes uh, life a little bit easier on the maintainability side. Uh, again, some bonus advice. Uh, take it if you will. It is free, of course. And that's it for this video, folks. Um, if you enjoy my videos and you find that they bring you some new knowledge or insight into writing Cucumber tests, then please subscribe and rate. Uh, if you have any questions, as always, uh, please leave a comment below. In particular, if you have any video suggestions, please do the same. Uh, thanks a lot for watching. Uh, until next time, ciao. Thank you.